Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to a video episode on GunLab.net. I'm Ian, and today I'm very fortunate to have here uh, chatting with me David Tubb. David is, of course, an internationally re renowned marksman, and uh, we're really happy to uh, take a few minutes of your time. Well, thank you, Ian. You bet. We, we, we thought we'd talk today. Uh, we, we have a, we load competitive ammo, we load uh, the superior shooting systems, we load a product called Final Finish Ammo, which is basically an aluminum oxide impregnated bullet. We sell the kit, we sell loaded ammo, uh, but in conjunction with that, we load a premium line of ammo, and we're about to uh, maybe actually move that up a step, uh, and we're going to have a, a line of ammo that we call Absolute, uh, kind of like the vodka, of course. This is absolutely everything that we can do, or that, that I know to do to make an accurate production round. Okay. And do there is obviously we're going to start with great components. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the brass actually will have a tub head stamp. Okay. Uh, we'll be using uh, the proper primer uh, for obviously the charge weight and <clears throat> we will be picking the appropriate in temperature insensitive powder based on the case volume and the diameter or the weight grain bullet that we're shooting and we just can't go by pound of powder and go this this temperature insensitive and go it's going to work in a 223 you it, it's kind of it's kind of like getting a suit fitted to you yeah. uh, and so from that avenue uh, when we charge one of these cases we will be charging our powder weight to one-third of one-tenth of one grain That's and precise. if we break that down and if we let's say we picked uh, Hydrogen makes a powder called Benchmark, and it's quite fine. It's a little bitty, small kernels, even though they're they're not very long. One of those kernels weighs about two tenths of one grain. So about every kernel of powder is what we're going to weigh to. Whereas normally a let's say Federal or Winchester or Remington, they're volumetrically charging their their premium ammunition. And so it's just like you, there, there is a powder meter or you used a scoop and you scooped it up and you scraped off the top and you poured it in the case. <clears throat> and consequently, uh, the average powder variation on that's probably a grain, grain and a half, maybe even larger than that, on a statistical average of thousands of rounds. Right. So first thing, we got a good, we got a good components. We're, we're loading the correct kind of powder. We're loading it to a, a very precise measuring or weight range. The next thing we do is we're going to take a, let's say we're going to load 175 grain Sierra Match King, and lots of people love those, okay? Well, we're going to take and, and perform another step to the bullet in the manufacturing process, and that is we're going to close the nose of it. And if you have a bullet that's, let's say, like this, and <clears throat> if, it's, if it's a little high on one side or one's a little open more than the other, they actually they travel through the air, they slow down and or get diverged a little bit when they should go to the target. Now normally it's that open tipped match bullet is what you see for premium ammunition. That's correct. And that's so, called a bolt tail because it's made from the back to the front. Right. And that's why it has that open at the front. That's right. It's because we're pulling the brass around from the back. That's right. And it's a lot easier to make it pretty much concentric by chopping off the tip. Right. They're, they're actually don't chop the tip. They're, 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 they're cutting a jacket. Okay. They're to length and then they're drawing the jacket. Okay. And as and as bullets are made, not all bullets draw evenly. So you might have one that the jacket looked like it was a little high on one side. It looked like a hangnail, let's say. Right. And <clears throat> what I want to do is I want to take and take the hangnail and and incorporate it into a smaller spherical diameter. And so it gets it more center to the axis. The other, the, the other advantage is obviously by doing that, if it's a little pointier, it, it, it will give you 20 or 30 points of increased ballistic coefficient, which is not anything big, but it's, it's, it's something you got for free right. doing this. But when you do do that, if you launched all these bullets at 2,500 feet a second, let's say, when they get to the target, they're all closer to their to their uh, the terminal velocity in the target, they're all much closer, right. as opposed to having a 50 foot or 50 foot variation in, in bullet A to bullet from bullet one to bullet ten, excuse me, where they're all going to be going down. Let's say they're all 1700 a second. Well, what does that do? If you make the if you make them slow down at the same rate, then they shoot a 
better vertical component group at distance. They're not going to help you on the wind. Okay? Yep. And the other, so that will be incorporated in this, in this absolute line of ambition. And then the, the final thing that we're going to do is we have load sensors on our seating dies, and nobody on the planet's got that that I'm aware of, kind of like some of this other stuff. When we, and so what we're going to be able to do is we'll be able to sort not only to charge weight, to a third of a grain, thir one third of one tenth of a grain, right. but we're going to be able to sort to bullet seating pressure. So that means if you have a, a round and it's and typically most ammunition jumps, the bullet jumps to the right leg. Right. Well, when it jumps, that means there's varying degrees of neck tension. Right. And if we're able to break our neck tension into excuse me, a couple of categories, let's just say it was two, right? then we're going to have a more uniform release of the bullet and consequently all the vibrations associated with bullet flight should be uniform and right. from there we're going to have a more accurate ammunition. Okay. And this stuff will sell competitively on a premium box of ammunition, or nice. like a premium box of ammunition. Uh, and it should be a fun project. Uh, we won't have we don't have the capacity of a jillion rounds a year, but uh, you know, nobody's done this, and it should be it, it, it should be good for the shooting community. Yeah, it sounds like a nice thing above and beyond what even a pretty proficient hand loader can take care of. Absolutely, and and that's because the proficient hand loader can probably load to one tenth of one grain powder charge. He can go in and point his bullets and do some segregation that way. Okay? But he doesn't have any clue other than the feel of his press. Right. Okay. And of course, it's leverage, so you got a lot of leverage on what is this bullet seating pressure. Okay. So, so. So, a question that occurred to me: You talked about having extremely high quality cartridge cases, the brass. Right. What What elements are there in a cartridge case? I know you look for weight. Right. But do you have to look for something like concentricity, or is that not really a concern? Sure. They draw a cartridge case, much like they make a bullet. And what I'm looking for is the body wall concentricity at the base and the neck, and I'd like to see it oh somewhere less than two thousandths, more like a thousandths would be optimal. The, okay. the, the brass that that we get from Norma, uh, the six XC brass, it's typically all less than a thousandths body wall run out front or back. And that this particular run of brass, this first run, is about a thou or a thou and a half. So it's very it's within okay. the range. You get you get cartridge cases that are three or five. That are which are probably not adequate for, for precision ammo. Uh, the, the next thing is, is you want to make sure that the head hardness is over 200, uh, basically on the uh, the Vicker scale. And a head hardness, if you've ever shot a, a rifle and you lift the bolt and it's sticky, mm -hmm. well, there, there could be, I mean, obviously there could be a pressured upload to a degree, but uh, if, you, if it's continual and this load doesn't show pressure, then you have a head hardness of your brass issue. Okay. Consequently, when you shoot it, it'll open extract easily. Okay. Because it reloadable. Is that because it's deforming? It's it's the brass is too soft and it's deforming around the extractor? No, it's too soft and it's adhering to the case wall or the okay. chamber wall. Okay. It's not it's not rebounding. Right. So. Okay. so I assume you're going to do 308 Winchester right. 760. That, that, that'll be the start. And then and then from there we'll have a subsonic line. Since we're loading our powder, we're using great powder and we're going to use weigh our powder so finitely, mm -hmm. then it gives us that leg up on a subsonic round. And not that a lot of people use subsonic ammo, but there's a call for it occasionally. A lot of people, you know, with the, with the advent of a lots of people who have suppressors now, and that's, yeah. that's a, yeah. so, sometimes you need to do that. And you know? probably a lot of the people who are actually using it, uh, there are more of those people who are looking for very high quality ammo Absolutely. than the general population. Sure. Well, if, if, you're, if you're, let's say your powder charge weights 15 grains in a, in a uh, subsonic and you can only throw to within a grain high or low on a volumetric charging system. Well, you have the you're going to have to stay on the bottom edge That's of where right. the speed of sound is. You know, yeah, I didn't think about that. As opposed yeah. to and then and not only do you have that, but you have temperature issues. You've got temperature issues on the firearm. Uh, is the powder at the front or the back? I mean, there's there's okay. there's a whole bunch of other parameters that, that uh, you know that need to be explored or need to be you know at least tested so, yeah, so, so that's truly subsonic you don't want to go crack when you shoot it you right know, and it lets you sneak right up to the maximum permissible velocity sure since you have a real narrow margin of error absolutely and of course subsonic ammo is is subsonic varying based on the temperature right because the 
the speed of sound is 1,077 feet a second plus the temperature. So if your round goes 1,100 feet a second and it's 27 degrees outside or 23 degrees outside, it's going to be exceeding the sound barrier simply right. because it's cold. Yeah. As opposed to an 80 degree day, which you wouldn't touch. So anyway, All I right. hope that was informative for you. Yeah, very much so. Um, are there any other calibers you're going to be doing? Uh, we'll load 6 C. Okay. Uh, and we'll probably end up loading 300 wing mag. We will we'll load 223. Okay. Uh, so, but uh, you got to start with one line first, and that's obviously it. Right. Uh, since we'll we'll only have the capacity for a, about a million rounds a year with what we have now. So that's that's a lot of ammo. Sounds like a lot of ammo, but in the grand scheme of things, they load four and a half million rounds a day at Lake City. So it's like, hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's like I got lapped. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and any idea when people can expect to see this available? Uh, I'd say probably within the next quarter. Okay. Without question. Cool. Be on the show, so. Sounds exciting. You bet. Right. Well, hey, thank you for Th talking th to th us. Thank you. you Appreciate bet. it. You bet. You have a good day. Thanks for tuning in, guys. Check back to Gun Lab for more information on firearms manufacture and ammunition and all things related.